showing up here on my Instagram. Awesome. So. I think I we're live on all platforms. Ooh, Markus. Oh, John Whalen just joined. Hey, John. All right. I think we're live with, I just clicked. Sarah asked to be in it again if, if that didn't work. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we're there. Hey, everybody. Uh, we're working. I can't believe that technology is working today. The full moon hasn't disturbed that at all. Uh, well, first of all, happy Halloween, Sarah. Same to you. <laughs> Thank you. It is the best holiday because everyone gets what they want. Everyone can be whoever they want to be. That's right. Uh, anyway, it's great to have you here, Sarah. Thanks for being part of the Musicians Workbench interview series. So for those of you that don't know, Sarah is an amazing jazz violinist. And I have a lot of questions, um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to just jump in here with one question that was probably the, the one most on my mind. So you've been teaching at the Manhattan School of Music for a number of years, mm -hmm. right? And I, m my question, I'll get there eventually, but the question is basically about the relationship uh, between jazz and education, because um, obviously jazz has a huge history of, of mentorship, and educators, you know, like John Coltrane uh, studied with, uh, who's that guy in Philadelphia? Gold, Gold, I can't remember his name. Um, the piano player, you know, and then so many great um, jazz musicians have this, this, uh, this amazing history of mentorship with, you know, other greats. And you are in this role right now as an educator at Manhattan School of Music. And there, there's a few layers to my question, I guess. So one is, if you could just talk a, a little bit about that, how you perceive your role uh, in that regard in the jazz world. And, and also because jazz, what I notice uh, in jazz is that so many professional jazz musicians get to where they are in their career through a jazz educational track. And they study jazz. So there's this, um, obvi obviously it's a, it's a, it's a complex musical art form that demands a lot of study, but a lot of people take a very formal educational route through it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to unpack here, but maybe you could just comment a little <laughs> bit about um, your, how you see the role of education in jazz and your role as a mentor slash educator. Whew. All right. <laughs> Let's see where to start with that. Um, you know, I was, I was watching the interview that you did with, with Daryl last week. And I, I think, um, I love what he said about uh, each player already having a voice of their own um, mm. and that our roles um, as you know, the older generation is to, you know, is to give people the encouragement to, to continue developing their voice, to embrace mm -hmm. um, their individuality and to find a way in which to, um, to share their, their particular voice. Um, I think my role is, is, is as a supporter um, and as mm -hmm. a person to perhaps give them that support and that nudge um, and uh, some guidance in what paths they might explore, how they might incorporate it into... Oh, sorry, I'm getting some... Sorry about that echo, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how to get rid of that. Uh, sorry guys about that echo. <laughs> Um, anyway, so yeah, just to, to basically give them the encouragement that they need to on their journey. Mm. And um, yeah, I, so I've been teaching at Manhattan School for, for a number of years. Most of my students right now are actually at Berkeley College of Music. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah, I've been teaching there for about five years or so. Um, okay. And then I have some students I see occasionally at New School here in New York. Okay. Um, so, you know, they're all coming from a variety of backgrounds. Some have had a, a really rich um, classical uh, education. Some have had um, no classical experience whatsoever, but they've come to um, violin playing through other, other traditions. So these are all um, violinists? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly yeah. violinists. At Berkeley, I've had, um, I've had a couple cello players um, mm. as well. So there's a little bit, uh, yeah, there's some instrumental variety there. But yeah, I, I, I do what I can to, um, to, guide these students on their journey mm. um, and to try to get them to know them as well as I can musically and to um, to see what you know, what I might be able to do to um, help them on their journey. Interesting. So yeah, I mean, obviously, both of these schools, the standard is pretty high just to get in. So I would expect them to come with, you know, a lot of, you know, their voice kind of already defined. 
Um, yeah, it was. I mean, everybody I've taught has their own personality, that's for sure, um, mm. personally, musically. And um, yeah, it's, that's what I love about teaching so much is that um, as a teacher, if, if you're, I feel if you're really doing it the right way, you're not teaching, you know, you're teaching each student in a very different manner based on their background, their right. personality and all that. So um, I, I feel like I've done, I've had a good day if I, if I end my teaching day exhausted. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I'm, re I'm just really trying to tune in to what my students need, um, how best to communicate uh, mm. my, uh, my ideas, how best to listen to them and making sure that I'm, um, I'm really hearing what they're trying to say, both in their music and their dialogue. Um, yeah, if, if all those things are going well, then I should be pretty tired by the time the day is Yeah, done. yeah, I know, I can imagine. I've stepped up doing a bit more teaching during COVID and I don't even have that many students, but I'm like, God, I can't imagine having any more because um, I ended in the day so exhausted. Yeah, yeah. So you're still teaching all these people virtually or how does that work? Yeah. So um, Berkeley went, uh, or it's basically all online uh, this semester. Mm. Um, next semester will be more of a hybrid model. Okay. Um, Manhattan School of Music is doing a hybrid model for the college. Um, mm. The pre-college is doing uh, all, is all remote. Um, and then new school is uh, remote as well uh, for this semester. So um, all of my lessons this, this semester have been online. On these okay. Lessons. So then the next semester yeah. will likely be the same. Gotcha. I, if you could, I'd like you to comment a little bit about um, any changes that you've observed in jazz pedagogy, like since you, since you got your master's, uh, what was it, at Indiana? Uh, no, I did my uh, undergraduate degrees um, in violin performance and jazz studies at Indiana University. Okay. And then I did my master's at uh, Manhattan School of Music. Okay. So I got that in 2006, I think. Yeah, that was oh, at MSM from 2004 to 06. Hmm. So. So, so have you noticed any, like, um, I mean, I was talking to Daryl a little bit about how, and he's not the only interview where we've, we've touched on this. You know, Daryl's very, very much from a, a fiddle background mm -hmm. and how, I don't know when this started, but in, it seems like in the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, the fiddle and violin worlds have have merged a little bit in both directions. Um, so there's been some changes um, maybe in the way tr traditionally classical musicians think about other kinds of music. Um, so I was just curious if you could comment a little bit about any changes that you've seen in, in jazz pedagogy or the way people study jazz. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's it's interesting what you were um, what you were talking about earlier as far as um, so much of what the j recent jazz pedagogy has been is has been very much in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously with generations prior when um, it, when the music was largely taught uh, through apprentice kind of relationships, where if you know if you wanted to work with somebody, you sought that person out, and you went to their concerts, you went to their uh, you went to their uh, sessions um you you just you kind of immerse yourself in that that world and in that um in that uh, circle mm -hmm. and with uh jazz education now being so largely based in the university it's it's an amazing thing because you do get a lot of um you get that that sort of um uh, circle and community of people that you want to learn from mm -hmm. um and teachers that you want to get guidance from um but i think sometimes what can happen is that you you stay within that bubble and there's mm -hmm. not as much of that idea of going out and seeking the music and learning on the gig and, and really sort of mm. um, just sort of learning from that sort of experience, um, not just learning within an academic bubble. So um, as far as changes that I've seen, I think what's been very cool, I think as of, you know, in, within the, like the, the more recent generations is the fact that we have access to so much through, um, through the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and especially during COVID, we've had access to so many amazing performances in spite mm -hmm. of the fact that we've had to, um, you know, make uh, lemonade out of lemons you know, mm -hmm. with not having live performances be an option. Mm -hmm. So I think um, what I'm noticing is that, yes, students are definitely taking advantage of what um, the academic environment can offer and what mm -hmm. we in that, in that um, community of, of musicians can, you know, what we can do for each other. Um, but I also see them t be taking a little bit more of an initiative in their own careers, in their own um, in their own education, and seeking um, opportunities, seeking in, in lessons and in performance opportunities, and really kind of supplementing um, their uh, their exposure to the art and um, how they are 
going about developing it. And I think that's honestly a really, really healthy way of doing it. It's just, you know, seeking as many um, resources as you can and mm. braiding, braiding it into, um, into your, uh, your evolution and seeing where that, yeah. where that goes. Actually, you, um, you, you said something which, which reminded me of a, a question. So you said taking, taking control of your own careers. And um, that just made me think of how much the music landscape has changed over the last 20 years, specifically the music industry. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I know, I think it's the University of Miami jazz program has like a music business dimension built into their jazz program. And um, I mean, is that something that uh, you can comment on Manhattan School of Music or just uh, the, the higher education world in general about how people might be incorporating more of a music business side into the whole education? Yeah, it's interesting because when I was doing my undergrad, um, there wasn't as much of that emphasis at all. Honestly, okay. um, it was very much about um, giving you the musical skills that you needed in order to, you know, pursue uh, pursue your your musical ambitions. There wasn't as much the um, the business side of, of that um, mm. uh, pushed. It wasn't until I think I right after I left Manhattan School that I, I was kind of seeing this wave of change in um, the courses that were being offered um, mm. to the students. Um, yeah, like just giving them the, the skills that they needed to do not, or they needed to have not just as musicians, but also as entrepreneurs. And yeah. um, I, I think that's wonderful because, you know, the, those, um, those paradigms, those infrastructures that were um, there for a long time as far as record labels and, yeah. um, you know, those kinds of contracts that could be something that could keep your career going for a long time. Um, those things aren't necessarily in, in, uh, in place anymore. And so um, it's, you know, it's a very liberating thing in a way to have that much control over um, how you shape and craft your, your, um, your career, but it's also a very overwhelming one you know, at the same time. So um, having those kinds of skill sets uh, at, your, you know, at your fingertips that can really uh, allow you to craft your career the way you want is something that I'm, I'm really excited for for this next generation of, of musicians. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as far as skill sets, it seems like you know, it used to be, I used to be really intimidated by how many skill sets that we modern musicians had to take on. Yeah. And, you know, with COVID, I've just kind of accepted it, you know, because like, what else can you do, you know, but. No, you kind of have to jump in and just be like, oh, well, I'm not going to drown. Well, just keep my head above water and just, you know, yeah. just see what I can learn along the way. Well, it's, you know, like knowledge is power. And I, I personally have felt um, like during COVID, I taught myself Pro Tools. I, I use Logic, but I had to teach myself Pro Tools. And, you know, I'm awesome. everyone is learning how to video edit now. And like, there's all these skills that I, that I used to just farm out to other people that I'm like, actually, I'm, I have to learn this now. And so it's been a blessing in that way. Yeah. And I feel like that's going to become a standard just from here on out. Definitely. This is a game changer. This whole, really I mean, in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, but this is a, a real game changer, and I think we're all going to emerge from this um, very different people, very different musicians, and very, um, yeah, with a whole different list of, of skills that we, we never thought we would, um, we would have to learn. I think mm -hmm. it's not even, at this point, it's not even a choice. I think really to, to really sort of be, um, uh, be able to do what we want to continue doing, you, you basically mm -hmm. have to have these skills. Yeah. yeah. We no, can, I kind of put it off for a rainy day. Like this is this COVID is our rainy day. <laughs> rainy year, yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, well, it's funny we're talking about. Um, so one change that you you've noticed is um, just there seems to be more attention being paid to the business side of things. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in addition to the music, I was having an interesting conversation with my. This is kind of just an aside, but you're welcome to comment. I was having an interesting conversation with um, some folks on my record label, which. Um, I mean, you, you've probably heard of Ropa Dope Records, right? Mm. So we will have these like monthly meetings, um, and well, th we were actually having them like weekly at the height of COVID, which was also the height of the, um, you know, the the racial violence, and at least in the the media. I mean, it's the media has given a little bit less of attention to it now, but obviously it's it's not going anywhere. So. Yeah it was an issue that we were having a lot of um, label meetings about and a lot of musicians on my label have a jazz background, you know, and, um, and there was this commentary about how maybe this is some, maybe the historical context of jazz, the racial history of jazz is something that should be integrated more or embraced more by the jazz education community. There was a few artists in the label who were saying that 
kind of what you said earlier that it's it's just become like this academic bubble and people just are just transcribing and i don't mean to like take the words out of context but um it's become a little separated from the history of of black music and the racial violence and and all this kind of thing and that uh, maybe not enough jazz programs are focusing on that yeah it's, it's less a question it's more just a, a subject that if you have a reaction to or I think contextualization is really important. And when I, I think whenever you're learning about history, if you don't necessarily have that personal experience to bring to uh, what you're reading, it's really hard to, um, I think for a lot of people, it's really hard to really understand it and to really um, have it emotionally just really gets, you, know, you, you are able to empathize and, and or able to just get a, a richer understanding of what, um, like how this music is oftentimes a reaction to what people were experiencing. I think yeah. what happened um, uh, with George Floyd, I think was a real wake up for so many people. And mm -hmm. it's uh, just the idea that it's, you know, they're living this or they're witnessing this, this sort of um, just like the, the racism, the systemic racism, the, the violence. And um, that makes a big difference in how they, how they make music, how they hear music, how they look at the, um, music of the past. Um, and maybe that will open their eyes to um, putting more of, um, I don't know uh, how to describe it exactly, but it makes history more real and mm -hmm. more relevant. And I think the more that that can happen and the more that you don't just see history as something in the past, but that you see it as something that is a living, mm -hmm. breathing part of everything that we do, um, and the decisions we make and, the, and all that, I think that's the more we can really make history a, a living, breathing thing as far as our understanding of it and the contextualization of it, the better off we'll be. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's so well spoken. Uh, make history a living, breathing thing, a present thing. Because I think I've, I'm guilty of that myself sometimes. It's, you know, it's, I mean, there's a lot of, like any song, you know, anything within, uh, the jazz canon, you know, has so much history embedded in just one piece of music between that composer and what they were going through. And um, I watched the John Coltrane documentary on Netflix earlier, uh, like a few weeks ago. And it was, yeah. it was fascinating to hear like what he was experiencing when he wrote these different, uh, what became monumental compositions in the jazz world, you know, everything from a love Supreme to, uh, to giant steps, you know, and, and to hear, you know, oh, he was actually like really, he was going through a really hard time or, yeah. you know, it's like there was uh, racial violence going on in Alabama, you know, the Martin Luther King speech, which inspired like a, a composition of his. And so I went back and I listened to his music and it just, it was it's so much more powerful. That's, yeah, it's interesting because I, I think we tend to, to consume music in sort of a playlist fashion. You know, mm -hmm. we just, we put on an album and we listen to it and we don't actually necessarily um, look into that album's history, like the timing of it, the, the, um, the, uh, the personnel, um, their background, their experiences, what mm -hmm. kind of drove this music to be created in this way in that moment. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I certainly remember doing, I, I didn't, I wasn't great about um, being, uh, be more active in, in understanding the music I was listening to. But like in college, I, I didn't necessarily listen to symphonies and actually try to, to do research on what those composers yeah. were thinking, what inspired their, their compositions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I wasn't great about that. I think I've, I've definitely noted that this is something I need to do more of because as you said, it just brings uh, so, much, so much of a richer experience to, the, um, to making music, to hearing music. Mm -hmm. um, that contextual, contextualization is a, is a huge, and um, yeah. the more that we can uh, make students become active listeners um, and active readers in the history of what they're, uh, just in the background of what they're hearing and, and the history behind it, um, yeah, the, I think the better off we're all, we'll all be. I 100% agree. Well, um, I'd love to, n not to end that particular subject now, if people want to comment um, if they have, or if they have any questions about that, uh, whether you're watching on Instagram or Zoom or Facebook, please leave them and we'll answer them at the end of the interview. But since you mentioned composition, I, um, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit and talk about your compositional process, if you have one. Maybe it changes every composition. You write. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm, um, 
I, I've been one who has been a little bit like scared of the writing process. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's one where I, I um I've sought a lot of guidance from from other composers as far as how to overcome that blank page fear. You know, when I, mm -hmm. I sit down with a, a notepad, I'm like, oh man, where do I start? <laughs> yeah. Um, so my my method has kind of been um, one where I, I always make note of ideas that come to my head as I'm going around town, doing you know doing things around the house. Um, I always have a notepad or my phone around handy so that I'm able to kind of jot down these ideas as they come. Because I'm not one who can just sort of say, okay, I'm going to put aside 15 minutes for writing right now and yeah. then be able to actually come up with something. That's just not some, yeah. uh, a way I can I can work. Um, so my my writing process has been very much that. It's been sort of like, all right, when an idea comes, write it down and, and sort of sit with it and, and see what uh, what comes of it. Um, but usually for me, the melody will come first and, um, and it will sort of uh, develop in that way. Um, I, I tend to be more of a melodically driven player um, mm -hmm. than uh, I, those, those things come to me first rather than the mm -hmm. harmonic side of things. Um, but uh, yeah, usually the melody will come first and then um, I'll get a rough sketch for what I'm wanting to do harmonically. And um, then that's usually when I'll, I'll start to, um, to bounce it off of uh, a couple of trusted sources as far as how okay. to develop that and enhance it. So, do you um, use the piano much? No, actually, I don't. It's funny. Yeah. My mom tried her hardest to, to teach me piano. Um, she's an amazing organist and pianist and mm. um, uh, was, uh, you know, you know we were, I was doing violin pretty young and, and um, she tried to, oh, she you know, was giving me piano lessons as well, music theory lessons and all that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I did okay at the piano, but <laughs> it was definitely a challenge. So, um, you know, I can plunk a few things out, but it's certainly, I think I, I'm getting in my own way if I try mm -hmm. to, to, to do anything on the keyboard. So I tend to um, either to, to do a lot away from my instrument, just singing, mm. um, or uh, actually what's been a, a real, uh, uh, sort of an interesting development in the composition process. Um, has been uh, me using my Hardanger violin oh, wow. for for writing because there's enough comfort with that instrument, of course, since it's you know pretty similar to the to the violin. That um, you have it you know, handy. If if not, don't go to the trouble. Oh, but no, it's in the other room. Sorry. Is it people? It, it, some people may not know what that is. Yeah, this it's really cool. It's a really an amazing instrument, and this one is actually um, sort of a rare one. So this is it's called a, a, a Hardanger Amore. Um, it was uh, designed by um, Salvador Hacadol, and it's um, it's actually a ten-string instrument. So it's got five strings on top that you play, and then it has five sympathetic strings that you know obviously resonate with. Uh, you, never, you know, you never touch them with the bow, but they just yeah. resonate with the vibrations of the instrument. Um, I think Bruce Molsky has one. Um, uh, Do you know Liz Knowles? She, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she has one. But there's a whole crew of people who have one now. Um, they're just, an, it's an incredible instrument. And I, yeah. I commissioned Save to make one for me about five years ago. And um, this, so there's enough familiarity with the instrument, of course, that, um, that it's comfortable for me to play. But there's mm -hmm. also enough um, newness in sound and in feel that mm -hmm. I will play a little bit differently, of course, than my violin. Mm -hmm. And that opens up different compositional ideas. Um, yeah. So that's been a really interesting thing, like just, you know, how I solo on one tune on the violin is going to be very different from how I solo on, sure. uh, on, the, on the, hard, uh, the hard anger. And same thing, like how I might compose or develop a melodic idea mm. on the violin is going to be very different from what I do in the hard anger. So um, I don't necessarily go to tendencies, like the same tendencies that I would have in the fiddle. Right. And that's been uh, really, um, it's kind of opened a lot of doors as far as like certain melodic ideas I had that I want to develop. Um, they've actually been able to move forward at a faster rate with the hard anger than with the violin. Are you going to put out an album with the Hardanger Amore? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. So one album that I have, well, I, there's one of the groups that I'm part of is called Nine Horses. Uh, it's a trio mm -hmm. with um, Joe Brent on mandolin and um, Andrew Ryan on bass. Um, so that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a blending of, um, the, the, well, all the pieces pretty much are Joe, Joe Brent's compositions. Um, uh, but they're a, a blending of, of our stylistic backgrounds. So it's some classical, mm -hmm. some jazz, some Americana, some Brazilian. So there's a lot of different things wow. that are kind of blending into uh, these unique pieces. Cool. So um, so he's written some of those pieces for the Heart Anger. Um, I have a new album, a jazz album coming out, hopefully in 2021. It's all recorded and mixed and mastered. It's just a matter of, of just moving forward with this next step, you know, oh, obviously the story not being, being available right now. But um, yeah, so on that album, I actually uh, used the Hardanger, I think on two, two tracks. Hmm. Um, so 
uh, yeah, so that's that's the first time I've actually really used the Hardinger in more like a of a jazz con uh, context. So I can't think of anyone else doing that. That is so <laughs> cool. I can't wait uh, to hear that. It's such an amazing instrument. I I yeah. I'm, it's a whole new um, component to uh, my voice, and it's it's just been yeah. really fun to explore that. So, so if if folks want to learn more about that, where should they go? Um, I'm going to be doing a massive <laughs> website update here over the next few months. So um, there'll be more information uh, out there eventually on, on that platform. But, you know, I, I always, I'm, I'm pretty active uh, poster on, on social media, mostly on Facebook and Instagram. Cool. So um, whenever there's news about uh, the album coming out or release dates being uh, projected, then yeah, I'll have more information on that, those platforms. About that. Sarah, Sarah Caswell, without the H for anyone watching. That's right. <laughs> um, well, I think we can open this up to questions. Let me just tell you a few people that are tuned in, because we have some really amazing, uh, well, all sorts of musicians, but specifically fiddle players. Ross Holmes is tuned in. Do you know Ross? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, Ross. <laughs> Ruri Golan, who is an amazing um, Scottish fiddle player. Nice. I uh, met him in Scotland, I guess, last year. Let's see who else. Uh, we got people from Brazil from Scotland, from the US, of course. Yeah, um, well, I'll ask you one question. <laughs> you, you may know this because you've, you've watched the interview with Daryl, but there's one question that my wife asks every single person who's on and is what age were you when you started learning the violin? So I was five and a half. Okay. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I remember that day, like it's t like totally burned in the brain. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the dress I was wearing, um, the car, you know, the car trip to the violin shop, um, riding wow. home, like, and yeah, it was, it's pretty, it, it's, it's pretty funny that I would remember it after all these years, but, um, yeah, so we drove to the violin shop, we picked up this little violin, little toy, <laughs> right? Basically. Um, and we drove home and, uh, I was super excited, like, you know, opened the case, uh, you know, took the violin out and, um, and I, you know, seen pictures and photographs of people playing the violin. I, I sort of like rough, I did an estimate of like where I thought the violin should be placed. Right. <laughs> and just like basically like, clutched the bow, <laughs> yeah. not, not good technique, which like clutched it and like, and played a, a couple A's. And I got mm -hmm. really excited because I, I, you know, it was the first two notes of Twinkle Twinkle. And I was like, oh my right. God, no. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then I got really That's frustrated. That's like a third of the song you already got, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but then I got really frustrated because I couldn't figure out how to get the next couple notes. Mm -hmm. But okay. I don't know, it was one of those things where I was a really shy kid. And, um, okay. you know, uh, the violin right away, it just it took me in and I, I just, I felt connected to it. And mm -hmm felt like I could could express myself through that, that mm. instrument. And I just had such a fun time learning that. It was kind of like a game and just, it was fun. And that was where I just felt the most myself, most to me. So you mentioned um, you have a classical background. I'm assuming you started with classical lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started doing Suzuki. I started learning through the Suzuki, the Suzuki method. Mm. Um, Indiana University has a, a fantastic pre-college Suzuki program. Um, mm. So I was part of that. Uh, program for um, I guess it was three or four years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but I mean, it was you know there was different levels based on book, and then you were uh, the more advanced players would, would uh, be in a, these other uh, more advanced ensembles. Mm. So I was part of that uh, thing for a while, and then um, I was really fortunate to uh, be uh, accepted into Joseph Gingold's um, studio when I was about twelve. So oh, wow. I worked with him from when I was 12 until he passed. So I guess I was uh, 16 years old yeah. when that happened. Um, but I, yeah, and I was doing jazz. I was taking jazz lessons. I started doing that um, when I was about nine, eight or nine years old. Oh, wow. And then okay. I was also taking um, Baroque violin lessons as well around that same time. Um, wow. So that so was... You, okay, so yeah, so jazz, <laughs> jazz has been like, you've been studying jazz almost as long as you've been studying classical or other forms of music. Yeah, it's, it's been a long time. I don't, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I had three separate paths of lessons, but mm -hmm. it was one of those things which I think, you know, a lot of these younger, like younger uh, fiddle players, um, is similar to their experience. Mm -hmm. You're exposed to this music, you don't really segregate it. You know, it's right. all just yeah. music. It's all, um, yeah. there's so many, there's so many more uh, things that are similar between them than there are differences. And, and as they also did, like little stylistic things that maybe you will, um, kind of separate them a bit, mm -hmm. but there's still, you know, there's still so much more similarity between them all. 
And for me, it was it was so much fun to sort of explore those um, those stylistic ideas and to see how like where all those those threads could be woven together. Like they could be woven together. Like the idea of, yeah. of improvisation being such a, a pivotal part, uh, such a, a central part of both jazz and baroque music. Um, yeah. The idea of taking a melody and having that be a skeleton around which you are embellishing and um, creating new melodies. And that was something that I just loved to see, like this music that was separated by hundreds of years. Yeah, they shared great that, point, yeah. Um, that, uh, that common skill. And you know, you're improvising in different ways, mm -hmm. but there's still that idea of, of the individual having a chance to express themselves through um, you know, the music of the composer. Beautifully said. I'm there's a lot of Brazilians that are watching. I don't know if they're still watching, but a lot of people from Brazil that have tuned in. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, this person looks like Yo-Yo Ma. Huh? Oh no, maybe not. <laughs> well, I, cause it's, let's see, the account is Bye Bye Mil Brasil. Okay, I know Yo-Yo Ma did a Brazil album. And I was trying to think of the name of it. Um, it's not, it's not Yo-Yo Ma. Um, my, my, my question basically is, uh, have you played much Brazilian music? I've, I've dabbled with it. Um, I actually went to a four day Shoro workshop in Port Townsend. Um, oh, wow. I guess this was three years ago. I, was, oh, I loved it. I loved the music. Love, love, love the Annette music. Annette Cohen's workshop? Or yeah, it was with, um, yeah, it was uh, that, that um, Dudu, uh, Dudu Maya yeah, and, Dudu Maya. Um, and the, uh, the brothers. I found space in the Lorda brothers. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, and Annette was there as well. Oh my God, it was, it was such a fantastic time. Um, that sort of immersion for those four days with that music and those, those musicians. My God, your draws on the floor every time they, they play. Totally, Just yeah. uh, the incredible music that they're putting out there. Um, yeah, I, I loved it. And I, I definitely, um, I've been wanting to get into it more. I've, I've got like three or four pretty thick books of Shoros that I've been um, playing through over COVID, you know, having a good time. Let's see. I'm sure you probably have all Do of them. they look like this? Oh, yes. That's the one I yeah, got. Yeah, that's the yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I, I'm at a level by any stretch of being able to perform it, um, but the idea, I, I love the idea of, of sort of incorporating a lot of those stylistic elements into um, mm -hmm. the way I, I improvise and, and just sort of the um, just hearing more about the way that these composers wrote and how they created melodies and just, I don't know, just getting into that more. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm also, got the technical challenge of some of those things. Those melodies are so gnarly, yeah. so in such an awesome way. And um, just like getting into that is, uh, has been a real fun, fun adventure. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely wanting to do more with it. That's cool. And it's cool that um, I just thought of this actually, but you know, you mentioned Nat was teaching there. She's a colleague of yours at Manhattan School of Music. Oh, isn't she? well, we actually we, we haven't, haven't actually run into each other um, oh, at okay. Manhattan School, but I've known Anat. Oh my God! So we were both uh, we were both sisters in jazz um, in 1998. So what used to be known as the International Association for Jazz Education. Okay. Um, IAJE, uh, which is now basically called GEN, which is the Jazz Education Network. Um, back in 1998, uh, mm -hmm. they started a program called Sisters in Jazz, and it was a collegiate, a, a, a competition where um, mm -hmm. girls who are in, in college could submit uh, you know, recordings, and um, they would be selected to perform, and it was worked with each other for about four days uh, with a, a, a performer as a mentor. Um, and we would, would perform at the IAJ conference. So the, uh, I was in it the first year they did it, and uh, it was me, Anat Cohen, um, Jody Prosnick on bass, she's up, up in Canada, uh, Dawn Clement, uh, she's a great pianist out in Colorado, and um, Lorraine Faina, who's a drummer, I believe, who's based in Florida now. Uh, but we worked with her, we, we were worked with uh, Ingrid Jensen for our four days during, um, during that workshop and um, had an amazing time. So I've known Anat for a very long time. At the time, she was at Berkeley doing her schooling, and okay. I was at Indiana University doing mine. So our paths have crossed many times since then. And um, yeah, she's just a brilliant uh, musician and just a, a, a wonderful person too. And in Indiana, uh, you knew my friend Ted Falcon. Oh yeah, yes. I know. I was I was reading up on that, and I was, I saw that you guys knew each other. I almost like yeah, you know, that's 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 really really cool that our 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 history connects in that way too. You know, it's funny. I've um, Ted Falcon. I don't know if he's watching. He seems to be like one of those Malcolm Gladwell connectors or something. Because <laughs> I, I I met Zach Brock earlier this year, who's actually going to be I think not the next interview, but two interviews from now. Great, great. And. Uh, when I said I knew Ted Falcon, he's like, what? You know Ted Falcon. 
and I was trying to, I think they met at um, Turtle, Turtle Island organized some violence summit in the 90s Gosh. that we both attended. But Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, Ted and I met, um, so actually it was a, I guess it was my, either my senior year of high school or my freshman year of college. There uh, were three of us at IU at that time. Um, there was uh, Ted, um, it was me, me, Ted, and then uh, Joe Denenzone, who's this fantastic uh, uh, violinist. He's uh, got a band called Stratospheris, and he uh, is an mm. uh, electric um, uh, violinist, rock violinist. And um, yeah, we all kind of like, we were all in the jazz department. And um, yeah, so that was where Ted and I first met, but that was, I don't think I've seen Ted in probably about 25 years. It's been a long time. <laughs> but he's he's still Ted. Let me, yeah, that's let me awesome. show you. We, we did a gig actually in his hometown, Allentown. Oh, um, wow. oh, he, I mean, he was born in New York, but he grew up in Allentown. Yeah. And so there were people there that hadn't seen him in 20, 25 years. Like a lot of his old, old high school friends that still yeah. live in Allentown. And after the gig, they're all like, yep, same old Ted. <laughs> It hasn't changed a bit. It hasn't That's changed awesome. a bit. Um, it, it seems almost like um, I could be completely wrong, but you know, obviously there are a lot more jazz violinists now than there used to be, but it seems like uh, 20 years ago or so, all the jazz violinists kind of knew each other. I don't know. Am I wrong? It feels that way. I don't know. I mean, I know there are a lot more, but I mean, it's the improvising string world has always been sort of like a, a yeah, it's been a family you know, and, right. um, you know, some you see a lot and some you don't see as often, but you still all know, know each other or know of each other. It's like one degree of separation sort of thing. It, it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's this, there's a definitely a, a family unit that kind of has come right. out. Of it. It's grown a lot, which is so great. It is. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, I'm always amazed. Um, the, the, the speak new cipher competition, mm -hmm. like how many entries they get every year. It's yeah. just, I mean, they must, I, I don't know actually how many instruments, entries they get but I'm, yeah, I'm sure it's a pretty healthy number but like even there's uh not before the semi-finalists like the first batch of violinists is incredible like it, you feel like any one of them could win it yeah, and it's like 30 of them you know? Yeah, I know and it's a different 30 every year it's mm -hmm. just amazing yeah no it's it's such an exciting thing to be seeing um uh, so many violinists stepping out and and sharing their craft and yeah. um yeah i'm i'm thrilled about it and you know I, you know obviously you know i'm i'm hoping that i get a chance to meet everybody you know it's just one yeah, of those right. like it's like that extended family you want to meet them all mm -hmm. um so uh yeah but it's it is it's the idea of, of the violin um having a voice and having a place in this music and it always has but i think you know now it's becoming much more visible and much more common mm -hmm. and that's what you want to see you want you, and everybody's of course their own individual voice and um the fact that we're having you're, you're seeing more and more of those people doing that is great well you know daryl said something uh, the, in the last interview, how it's it's impossible not to have your own signature sound on the violin, and so it, it would make sense that you'd want to play jazz on it because jazz is so much about having a voice, you know, like your improvisational language, you know, uh, and your compositional language. So many of the great players, like you hear them and you're like, oh yeah, that's Kenny Warner or that's Chick Corea or that's Herbie Hancock, within a few notes. You know, so I can see how those two things are really compatible. Well, I'm glad to see that other people are, other violinists are, are seeing that more and more. Definitely. Um, I'll just, let me just check Facebook, see if there are any questions. I don't see any in the Instagram feed. Um, so if those are all the questions, then we can, I suppose, end this for today. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all for today. <laughs> okay. But um, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your time and uh, and just your wisdom on on all these very diverse subjects, music and beyond. Oh no, this is this was great, and um, it, you know, it's just it's a wonderful thing that you're doing, like bringing all of us together and having a chance to to talk and to yeah share our experiences, share our thoughts about these things, and to you know to gather basically around the music that we love. So this is, absolutely, thank yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well. <laughs> It's, it wouldn't be possible if people didn't say yes. So thank you for saying yes, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, we're gonna end the, the Facebook Live here. Let's see, stop live and stop.